So good to see everybody here this morning. Praise God. In good spirits, good expectation. God's doing good things, isn't he? No reason to have be down in the dumps. You know, the psalmist said, why are you so downcast, O my soul? Hope in God. Expect God to do something awesome in our midst. Amen. Hallelujah. That's what I'm expecting today. You know, we've been doing a lot of teaching the last few months and laying a lot of groundwork. And that's the way you, way you have what we call lasting revival. It's, you know, if you have wrong believing, it's going to end any revival real, real, real quick. So we've been spending the time laying the foundation and getting everybody believing right, expecting right. And, you know, that's, that's what our, a large part of our teaching is about. That's why I do a lot of teaching is because of that right there. Because, you know, when we experience revival in our life or spiritual awakening, whatever you want to call it, an outpouring of the Spirit, everyone, all of those revivals of the past ended when people started believing wrong. Amen? That's why we need to keep our believing right, right in line with the new covenant that we've been talking about. Not mix it all together, you know, old, new, and everything else in between. But we're, we're new covenant believers. Amen? And that's why... The Bible says that we're to renew our minds. What are we to renew our minds with? With a new covenant, the new way of living. Amen? Amen. With this life of faith that we're talking about right here. Well, I'm going to attempt to uh, land the plane today and finish up this series because we need to move on. There's a lot of things that God wants us to do. But I believe we're getting into the season now of demonstration. Amen? I believe we laid the yeah. groundwork, the faith level, the expectation is up there. And, um, and if it isn't, yeah, that's your fault, not mine. Praise God. We've been laying it out there for you. And you can always go back and listen to all the teachings we've done uh, that's foundational. But it should come down to demonstration. Amen. We should have a demonstration of the kingdom of God and the power of God on the inside of us. We are carrying these things around. But, you know, we shouldn't just carry them around. We should be demonstrating them, distributing them to other people. Amen. That's what it's all about. So our expectation needs to be high based on the Word of God. But uh, last week we talked about uh, the fact that we have better faith than even people under the old covenant. And so I want you to go back over to uh, Hebrews chapter 12 once again today, Hebrews the 12th chapter. We're going to look at a couple of things just in passing review that we talked about last week, just kind of bring everybody up to speed. This is, I think, our 15th message in this series, so... Uh, if you're just now kind of getting on at it, you know, you can always go back and listen to the uh, YouTube stuff. And by the way, uh, uh, the, the live streaming on YouTube has been disrupted because they've upped the subscribers on that. So we're looking at other avenues. We're going to have some other live streaming available, other avenues for that. But in the meantime, we're, we'll be putting this on as a pre-recorded message uh, the next day. You know, Tuesday will go on Wednesday. Sunday will go on Monday, those kind of things. You'll get, still get the same word, praise God, but Amen. just not necessarily the live stream right now. But we're working on that. Amen. But here in Hebrews chapter 12, of course, Hebrews 12 follows Hebrews 11. Isn't that right? And Hebrews 11 talks about the hall of fame of faith. All those people under the Old Testament who God was able to do something mighty in their midst. And it all began with that one phrase, by faith, by faith, by faith. Because that's the, the lifestyle of a new covenant believer. It's all, about, it's all about faith. Amen. But you know, all those Old Testament believers who by faith God did something for and through, uh, something awesome, miraculous, supernatural. At the very end of that chapter, it says, you know, that God has prepared something better for us. Talking about new covenant believers. So, in other words, the kind of faith that they had under the Old Covenant, even though they, uh, God was able to do some awesome things in their midst, we've got something better than they had. Yes. Why? Because we have a better covenant right, yeah. than they had, established on better promises. In fact, a lot of the promises under the Old Covenants, and I say Old Covenants, the promises there are now realities for every believer. They're not promises of something future anymore. They're realities that Jesus provided in his finished work in his death, burial, and resurrection. And really, that's what the new covenant's based on. It's based on the finished work of Jesus, the complete work of Jesus. We're not having to do anything to finish up an incomplete work. 
We're not trying to do something in and of ourselves to try to make up some insufficiencies that Jesus left undone. No, it's all sufficient. It's all done. It's all completed. It's all finished. And now our faith is based on the finished work on Jesus himself. And that's why he says here in Rome, uh, uh, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 2, he says, looking unto Jesus. Now other translation says, looking away from all that will distract and looking unto Jesus. You know, there are things that will distract us. Isn't that right? Well, in context, what he's talking about right here, things that distract are things that these, these group of believers were, were, were going after. They had been distracted away from the pure message of the gospel of Jesus, and they were going back under the law to some degree in legalism in order to try to make up some insufficiencies and incompletions uh, in the work of Jesus. Well, there is none. There are, there are none of those. So, so that is, that's, just, that's just a fallacy. You're just wasting time if you're trying to finish a finished work, <laughs> amen, to complete a completed work. And that's what we're talking about with Jesus. So notice in the new covenant, he's, he's talking to us believers. After he's established the better covenant that we live on in today as the new covenant, he said, looking unto Jesus. Well, see, they couldn't necessarily look unto Jesus the way we do today. Now, they could look forward to Jesus. Of course, they did. And their faith carried them over into the supernatural. But now we're looking back at the finished work. These are realities for every single one of us. And says, so it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Now, he's all inclusive here, isn't he? Paul didn't say it's my faith, but you can't have this. It's just for a few select few, you know. No, he said our faith. And notice Jesus is the author and the finisher, or we can say the initiator, the originator, and the developer of this faith right here. Amen. Now, why is he the author and the finisher of this faith? Well, because it's his faith. It's the same faith that he has. See, Jesus not only came to initiate and develop this faith in us, he also demonstrated it. The things that we see Jesus doing, the way he lived on the earth, is the way we should be living on the earth. Amen? You know, and just because we, we haven't gotten there yet doesn't mean that we should be so discouraged that we don't go after it. In fact, we need to just be relentless in going after this thing right here. Because, you know, the faith that you start with, of course, is not the faith you finish up with. Why? Because Jesus is constantly finishing or developing that faith. You know, we looked at last week in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, it says that the just, that's us, yeah. all of us, the just shall do what? Live by faith. Not just experience faith every now and then. Not just to wear a faith t-shirt and say, I'm a faith guy. No, we are to live by faith. Well, if we're to live by something, if God's expecting us to live by something, it's got to be more in that hit and miss kind of idea concept of faith that floats around the body of Christ most churches we've got to come to the place where this is a sure thing this is something that we can solid that we can plant our feet on that we can live by 24 7 that you know we don't just kind of get it out and, and, and you know I have the mothballs every now and then you know when we're in a real dire need and then we try to use faith when we're using faith all the time it's not going to be foreign to us and that's the way we're going to be developing faith. And I've encouraged people, we've, we've done series on living by faith before, taught on the mechanics and those kind of things of faith, and there are some mechanics of faith. But, you know, really what a living, powerful faith is, is a walking, living, intimate relationship with God Almighty. Because how can you trust somebody? How can you have faith in somebody you really don't know that well? You know, we're telling people to trust God, but then we also tell them on the other end, you never know what God's going to do. You know, what kind of faith is that? Well, you can't build your faith on you never know what a God's going to do. I mean, you can't build faith on that. you got to build faith on knowledge, on knowing, on solid foundational truths from the Word of God, realities from the New Covenant. And see, of course, God has given us these things. They're all sure in the body of... They're all sure in the finished work of Jesus. Now, see, this is quite different than the, the kind of faith that they tried to operate under the old covenant law of Moses. Because the law of Moses all focused on self. 
all focused on us. So the faith was in ourself and our ability and our performance and our, you know, earning and, and meriting and all those kind of things. But see, God wants to take us up to a faith that's not based on us, but a faith that's based and centered, focused on Jesus and Him alone. And see, we read last week over in Mark chapter 9, uh, verses 1 through 8, we talked about uh, the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus went up on the mount, remember that? Was transfigured before Peter, James, and John, and, and you know, they were just flipping out, you know, their minds are being blown up there, and, and then all of a sudden they see Elijah and Moses sitting there talking to Jesus. And Peter, not knowing what to say, he just blurted it out. He said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. <laughs> He should have stopped right there. But then he said, why don't we just build three tabernacles and just stay right here? And unknowingly, Peter put Jesus and the new covenant on the same level as Moses, Elijah, and the old covenant. And I tell you, God the Father was not going to stand for that. He immediately interrupted that stuff right there. And he says, this is my beloved son. He said, hear him. He didn't say hear them. He didn't say build a camp and stay there. He said, hear him. And then all of a sudden, the next verse, they turned around and they saw Jesus only. The other two disappeared. Why? Because Jesus took their place. The new covenant changed places and overrode the old covenant. Jesus fulfilled it all in its entirety and then replaced it with this new and better covenant that we're talking about here. And of course, that's a whole new way of living right there. The way of life and the way of faith that we're talking about is a whole new way of living as New Covenant believers that we're just now tapping into. Praise God. You know, like somebody said, you know, we haven't arrived yet, but at least we've left the station. You know, we're on down the road a little bit. Amen? Well, let's keep on going down the road. Let's find out how to live proficiently by this faith. I believe it's possible because the Lord requires that of us. He wants us to live this way because you will, never, you will never experience things in life and receive things in life through your methods and means, through earning and deserving the way you are with faith. Faith will take you to higher places and deeper depths. It will take you to places and receive things that you never thought possible. Amen. And see, that's, what, that's the life that God has for all of his kids. But you got to do things his way. you got to do things the way he wants it done, and which is all by faith. And we're not just talking about faith in self. Amen? You know, I heard, hear a lot of people, they quote verses like, you know, Mark 9, 23. And, you know, it says, all things are possible to him that believes. But they're really pointing it at themselves. They're thinking, you know, just believe in yourself. Well, there's a certain amount of uh, truth to that. But really, that's only going to carry you so far what you can do. But if you want to go to the realm that God has for us, if you want to go to the supernatural and you want to live that miraculous new covenant lifestyle that we want to live, you're going to have to bring your faith up to faith in Jesus and Him alone. It's all about hearing Him and seeing Him alone and not anything else. It's all Jesus-focused and all Jesus-centered. See, that's what makes this whole new covenant better in every regard because it's not based on you. It has nothing to do with you other than you're believing. It has everything to do with Jesus and what he has done for us. Amen? So this is the kind of lifestyle and the kind of faith that Jesus initiates for new covenant believers and develops under a new covenant believer. Now, let's go back to chapter 11 real quick. And begin with verse number three. I don't think we read this one last week. But this whole narrative about faith began here at the beginning of uh, chapter 11. And, you know, before it even talks about all the people under the Old Testament who did things by faith, it actually talks about God. Because the kind of faith that Jesus authors and develops in us is really the God kind of faith. It, it actually is God's faith. And thank God, because we are born of God, we are faith beings and faith new creations of a faith God. God created us, recreated us, I should say, in His likeness and in His image. And see, this is the way God wants us to operate and live, just the way He does. And this is not just for the sweet by and by when we all get to heaven. Don't discount, don't get negotiated out of the higher life that God has for you. Don't just settle for something secondary and second rate. God has something better for you. 
Amen. Now, here in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, it says, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Now, I like a couple other translations of that. It kind of brings out a little bit better meaning for us. The Barclay translation reads, It is by faith that we understand that the universe was constructed by the word of God. For the seen had to take its origin from the unseen. Notice that. The seen had to take its origin from the unseen. So everything that you see around us, the physical realm, the natural realm that we live in today, all had its parent force in an unseen realm of God, the kingdom of God himself. It all started with him. The Moffat translation reads, It is by faith that we understand that the world was fashioned by the word of God, and thus the visible was made out of the invisible. You know, we talk about the seen and the unseen a lot. 2 Corinthians 4.18 reads it, uh, says it this way. He says, Do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal, or we can say unchangeable. Now, why is it when he's talking about the seen and the unseen, we're talking about the visible and invisible. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not real. See, just because it's invisible to your physical eyes, you're not able to contact it with your physical senses, does not mean it's in an unreal state. No, the spiritual realm is actually more real than the physical realm. And you say, well, how can you say that? Because the physical realm took its origin from the parent force, the spiritual realm. God as spirit created everything that we see with his faith, with the word of faith released out of his mouth. Well, why is he telling us this for? Because this is the same kind of God kind of faith that we have and are to live by and operate in. Amen. Now, this is, you know, when, when, when we begin to see this right here, and we begin to operate this way, and, you know, the, the Bible talks about that we walk by faith and not by sight. You know, I think there's a reason it, it talks about and refers to it as a walk of faith. Because, you know, even in the physical realm, when you learn to walk, you didn't just, you know, hop out of the crib one day and start huffing it around the, you know, around the house. Thank God for that. I mean, you know, the parents would have been in trouble, I can tell you. But, you know, you don't just learn to just walk just instantaneously. There, there's a, there's a, a progress to you learning to walk in the physical realm. I believe this the same way in faith. But so many, many people have just given up. They become discouraged, despondent, disillusioned with this walk of faith. And they say, well, I guess that stuff really doesn't work. Because the enemy has just talked them out of it, has just led them down bad experiences. But listen, there are, we, thank God that we weren't like that in the physical realm. That, you know, when you fell on your rear end, and it wasn't as far to fall on your rear end back then, on purpose, amen, as it is now. But when you were learning to walk, how many times did you stumble and fall? Skin your knee. You know, fall on your rear end, all those kind of things. But yet, children are relentless. They'll just get right back up and just go at it again. You know, because they see their parents walking this way. See, they, they're, they learn, they're trying to learn to walk based on what they see you doing. And Jesus is saying, hey, this is how you do it. God's saying, hey, this is how you do it. This is how you use this faith. This is how you walk by faith. That's why we're to keep our eyes and focus on him. Not off experiences, not off negative things, but we're to keep our eyes on the Lord. Why? Because he walked this way. However he walked is the way we walk. Amen? Amen. See, this is the way we learn even in the natural realm. Well, this is the way you're going to learn in the physical realm as well. And see, God, a spirit, created you to be a spirit being. He wants you to operate on his level. God's invited you to walk and live on his level. Now, I know there's a lot of religious naysayers out there who said, you know, who do you think you are? And what do you think you're doing every time you, you start talking this way? Well, we're doing exactly what our Father does. We're being imitators of God. That's the way we're supposed to live. 
Now, a lot of people, they don't, they kind of discount all this because, you know, they don't really need it at the present time. But let me tell you something. In your life somewhere, you are going to need to learn to walk by faith. Life is tough. In fact, it is impossible for you to just walk in the natural and be an overcomer. You're going to have to learn to walk and live by faith. So that means we're going to have to learn from Jesus, right? He's the author and the developer of our faith. Now, look back at verse number 1 there while we're here in Hebrews 11. And notice this. Verse number 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Notice that. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So faith actually believes in something and touches the unseen realm and bridges the gap over here to where it manifests. Amen? So this is how faith operates. But notice that faith can only give substance to what is hoped for. See, most of the time when people think, well, I just don't have any faith, or I've got a faith problem, they don't really have a faith problem. They're not, th their faith is not the issue, it's the hope on the inside of them. Now, we've, we've defined hope as being a confident expectation of God's goodness manifesting in your life. And that's true, isn't it? It's, a, it's an expectation. Hope is ex expecting something. But you have to have the faith to give what you expect to manifest in your life. But what if you're expecting wrong? What if, you're, what, what if your hope on the inside of you is distorted? What if this has been marred by just negative stuff in life? And see, this is what the enemy tries to... From day one, when you're born on the earth, he starts trying to train you in disappointments and negative stuff. Because he's trying to get a negative hope on the inside of you. See, if he can install a negative image, and that's really another definition of hope, is being able to see something on the inside of your heart that you really can't see out here yet. That's why you have to have hope. I mean, you can't, even, you can't even drive home without that hope or that image on the inside of you. How are you going to find your way home? You're following something. You don't see your house, but you know if I continue to go down this pathway, I'll get to that destination of my house. Well, it's the same way spiritually, the same way with faith. This is how hope operates. See, I'm seeing my, my destination on the inside, and I know if I just continue to follow the path the directions laid out in the Word of God, I'm eventually going to get there. Amen? So faith is, or hope is that ability to see something externally. But the problem is we've been trained in our hope just to take what's on the outside and allow that to form the inner image in our heart, that hope image. And the stuff out here is negative. And if all you're listening to out here and seeing out here is just a bunch of negative stuff from the world, the world's feeding you, then you're going to have a negative hope image on the inside of you. And guess what? Faith is going to give substance to that. Your faith is going to give substance one way or another, good, bad, or ugly, to whatever's on the inside of you. It's going to work. Now abides these three, faith, hope, and love. It'd be better for us to take the Word of God and build the right hope image on the inside of our heart, so we're seeing things correctly. See, this is all about a perspective. See, for us to walk and, and live in the faith of God, the faith of Jesus that he authored and is developing, you're going to have to keep your eyes focused on the right things. And right now, everything is, is pulling at your attention to try to get you. And see, this, this is the adversary. The enemy is all about mind time. He wants to get inside of you. It's not just an external attack on the outside. He's trying to infuse something on the inside of you that will establish a negative hope because if he can get that negative image, he can get you, get you in a perpetual struggle bus where you're just continually bringing forth just negative stuff all the time. And see, if you've had a condition in your life or a condition in your body you've, you've had to deal with long-term you know, the problem is not God healing you. The problem is sometimes that we have to change that hope image on the inside of us. You know, Abraham had to do this. Romans chapter 4 verse 18 says that Abraham against hope believed in hope. Well, what does that mean? 
Well, he had to change that negative image, that hope image on the inside of him that had been developed all of his life by that negative experience of not having kids. In fact, he told God one day, he said, this is Genesis 15, he said, God, what are you going to give me seeing I go childless? Seeing. In other words, God, see it like I do. Well, that's not going to change his situation. He said, what are you going to do? Uh, what are you going to give me seeing I go childless? Look, the, the only one in my house, my heir, is Eliezer of Damascus. Poor Eliezer of Damascus. <laughs> you know. Look, look, God. In other words, God, look at this. This is the way I see it. Well, I want you to just be real. Well, he was being real with God, but that's not going to change anything. Amen. So what did God do? He said, I want you to come outside. Uh, he wasn't inviting him out there. He's going to beat him up. He said, I want you to come outside. <laughs> In other words, get out from the place that you have created for yourself with all those limitations. Right. And he said, I want you to look at what I've done. I want you to start counting the stars. You know, what are you counting out there? Well, back then, you didn't have all the light pollution that we do that now. In fact, there's some places you can go now, and you see a lot more stars than you do around here because of light pollution. But, you know, back then, he started counting stars. He said, so shall your descendants be. When the sun comes up, you can't see the stars. Go, uh, go report to the dust fields and start counting dust because that's how many your what is he trying to do? He's trying to affect that hope image on the inside of him. See, God needed his cooperation. A lot of people, that, you know, religion is just painting this picture. Well, if it's God's will, it just happened. That's not true. Because it was God's will for, God, for Abraham to be the father of many nations, yet he wasn't. He wasn't. And it wasn't until God had his cooperation. Amen. In other words, he had to take his word. Abraham had to take God's word. And the Bible says there in Romans chapter 4 that he began to consider the word only. Not the outside circumstances, the situation, all those other things. He began to consider the word only. And again, that's, that's hard to do because there's so many things that are vying for our mind time today. Trying to distract us, trying to pull us away. And you know, I tell you, when you got symptoms in your body, they will, they will talk loud. I'm telling you what is the truth. Don't you think that Abraham didn't have that situation? I mean, every birthday, he added another candle on the cake. It was getting brighter and brighter every year. He was having to blow harder to get all those candles out. <laughs> so Abraham had some work to do, didn't he? But you know what? It was actually the word that does this. There's only one thing strong enough to pull down those strongholds in your mind and heart. And that's the word of the living God. The living, sharper than two-edged sword word. Yes, and when you begin to meditate the word, give the word the time. More time that you do than everything else out there. Give it the attention. Give it the focus. Look to Jesus. And not get distracted by everything else. Then God has something to work with. He'll begin to build that hope image, that right hope image on the inside of you. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7, one of my favorite uh, Proverbs, it says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. He is, he's living out whatever image that he thinks or sees himself on the inside. It's not just what, you know, as God sees him, so is he. He has to see himself the way God sees him. In other words, whatever God's word paints, the picture it paints on the inside of you, you will live that out. That's what your faith will give substance to. But again, if you have the wrong image, the faith is going to go working to, get, to bring to pass and manifest, give substance to the wrong image. And then people wonder, you know, why, is this, uh, uh, why am I on this perpetual struggle bus and I just can't get off of it? Well, the problem's internal, not external. So you start trying to fix things on the outside. The problem is on the inside with that hope image. Amen. Amen. Again, your faith is working. It's just giving substance to the wrong image. If you've got the wrong image on the inside of you, you're seeing things incorrectly. Amen. Amen. Brother Hagin used to say it this way. Um, he said, if I could get people to give as much diligence, consistency, and attention 
to the Word of God as they do medicine and all this other stuff. He said, I can get them healed. He said, the problem is they don't give the God time of day. Yet they'll do exactly what the doctor tells them to do. And I'm not telling you not to do that. I'm just telling you, give God equal time and you can get healed. Because you've got to build that hope image. And I tell you, if it's been ingrained in you, if it's been got some deep roots, you're going to have to rely on the Holy Ghost. And he's on the inside of you. He will help you to change that image on the inside. Amen. Faith gives substance to things hoped for. Well, you know, under the new covenant, in fact, real, real quick, as you're there in Hebrews chapter 11, go to 7. See, 7, 11. Hebrews chapter, okay, anyway, y'all here, right? All right, he, Hebrews chapter 7. We've looked at this, verse number 19. But notice it says, for the law, that's the old covenant, right? It said, for the law made nothing perfect. But I said, we're not under that anymore. He said, on the other hand, this is where we are. He said, there is the bringing in of a better hope. Notice, a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. So he's telling us right here, this new covenant gives you a better hope. Why? Because it's not based on sin. It's not based on the fall of man. It's not based on condemnation. It's not based on separation away from God. The new covenant in the finished work of Jesus, based on Jesus' finished work, gives us a better hope. It, it opens up to us an expectation of goodness that they, they couldn't have in the Old Testament. Why? Because they were still living under the unfinished work. We're living in the finished work. Amen. That changes everything. See, we've got to get to the point where the cross changes everything in our life. Jesus didn't come down here just to establish another religion, but a whole new lifestyle, a new and living way for every single one of us. This a lot higher than anything they ever thought about under the old covenant. But what did the old covenant do? Well, 2 Corinthians 3 tells us that the law of Moses was the ministry of condemnation and death. See, it's that condemnation and death that produced an evil hope image on the inside of people. But it also says that the new covenant, by contrast, is the ministry of righteousness and of the Spirit. Amen. That's the life of God. Righteousness is not just doing righteousness is who you are. It's being right with God. I'm not separated away from God anymore. The sin issue has been done away with through the finished work of Jesus. We got to preach this bold. We got to live it bold. This kind of hope is a bold hope. It gets out there and, and reaches into places where Jesus the forerunner has already gone before us. It sees possibilities where people are looking and they say, hey, no way that's going to happen. Why? Because it's not factoring just what I can do, what men can do. Because it's not self-focused. It's not self-conscious. It's all Jesus-conscious and Jesus-focused. So being Jesus-focused means that my faith is going to go to His level. Wherever Jesus went, that's where my faith is going. Glory to God. Man, I'm preaching a lot better than y'all are saying amen today. Glory to God. That's all right. I'm going to preach it myself. Y'all just get in on it. Praise God. Because this is the lifestyle. This is what God has opened up for us in the new covenant. It's not a boring life, by the way. People go out in the world because they're, they're looking for more excitement. Well, when you're talking about excitement, religion is not going to give you any. But this relationship and this walk of faith, man, it'll give you all the excitement and adventure you, want, you know what to do with. And it'll bring victory in your life where nothing else will. Hallelujah. Now, let's, um, man, there's so many places I could go. I've got to finish this up today. Let's, let's go back over to Mark's gospel, chapter 9, to begin with. Mark's gospel, chapter 9. And we just referred to that a minute ago, and we, we looked at it last week about the Mount of Transfiguration and how uh, Jesus was transfigured. And, of course, the whole thing that came out of that was a changing of the guards. Jesus was instituting this new covenant that we live in. 
And of course, he was introducing a new covenant lifestyle, which is all a life of faith. And so that's why God the Father said, hear him and see him only. Hear him and you're only going to see him. Nothing else, not you. You got to get you out of the picture. You got to get your works and all that self-righteous stuff out of the picture. You got to come to the place where I am focused entirely on Jesus and his finished work, what he did for me. And so after that, you begin to see Jesus introducing and installing this new covenant life of faith in a more bold way than he did previously. And so when we get down to uh, verse 14 and following, it talks about the, uh, when Jesus came off the Mount of Transfiguration and, and then he saw some, some of the Sadducees and the scribes, they were discussing disputing with his disciples he had left down there and he went over there and said what are you talking to them about and and about that time he hears the the father of that child speak up and he said "I, i brought you my son who has a spirit a demonic spirit wants to throw him into the fire and into the water to destroy him and uh he said uh he said and if you can do anything now, this is, this is the Father's response to Jesus. This is what he said to Jesus. He said, if you can do anything, verse 22, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. See, that is really an old covenant mindset. If you can do anything, if you can do anything. But notice Jesus responded with a new covenant response. Verse 23, well, I quoted just a few minutes ago. Jesus said to him, if you can believe. That is new covenant language. You know why? Because it's not about doing anymore because Jesus has already done it. We're talking about a finished, completed work. So now it's a matter of us believing in what Jesus has already done, what he has deserved and earned for us. And see, our believing takes us to that level. So it says, if you can believe, notice all things, how many? How how, was that... Is there any exclusions here? Is it like, you know, the cell phone bills that have all those footnotes at the bottom, exclusions, or one of those cell papers you get, you know, 50% off, but you go in there and it excludes everything but one little item and it's it's no good. (laughs) Now, that's not what he's talking about right here. Amen. I got so aggravated with some of that, I just started throwing them away. But anyway, he said, if you can believe all things, no footnotes, all things are possible to him that believes. Why? Because your believing takes you up to the level where God can do something in your life that's supernatural. That if you can't do it, and in this case, this man had tried everything, just like a father would with a suffering boy like that. He had tried everything in the world. He, had, he finally heard about Jesus, brought his boy to Jesus. Jesus was up on the mount at that time. The disciples could not cast that spirit out. And he was just perplexed. He said, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said, if you can believe. See, that's what he's telling to every new covenant believer today. Every new covenant believer. See, I have to preach this longer and harder to folks many times because, again, the enemy's just gotten in there and just created a whole pattern of disappointments where all you're seeing is negative things and failures and all that. But listen, Let's go on down the tracks a little bit further. Let's have our faith developed a little bit more. Amen. Let's find out how to live and walk by this. I, I tell you, I'm just not, I'm not a loser. I'm just not one of those who wants to just quit and give up because, yes, I've skipped my knees trying to learn to walk. I've fallen to my rear end I don't know how many times. But at the same regard, let's get up. Amen. Let's get up. Let's find out. Where we missed it. Let's find out how to get a hold of this. Amen. Amen. Let's make an impact. So he said, if you can believe all things, all things are possible to him that believes. Not does, but believes. Believing is new covenant language right there. Amen. Then we go over into chapter 10. And of course, that's the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler came to Jesus based on his own self-righteous works under the law. He said, what good thing can I do, master, that I may obtain or inherit eternal life? Well, the reality is there's nothing good you can do to get that. But he thought he could. He thought he could keep the law and do that. Jesus said, you know the law, the the commandments and all this. 
And, and, and the boy responded. He said, well, all of these things I've observed from my youth. He was deceived. He was deceived. He thought he had, but he hadn't. Jesus said one thing you lack. See, the law is always going to find that one thing where you're lacking. Because you've got a lack somewhere. You've got an insufficiency. You've got a coming up short uh, area in your life somewhere. But you know what? In every one of those things, the grace of God makes up the difference. Yeah. For our coming up short, our insufficiencies, our weaknesses, our failures, our disappointments, the grace of God is greater and bigger than that. Yeah. See, that's where our faith is. Our faith is not in us. If our faith is in us, we're going we're gonna to end up failing. But if our faith is squarely on Jesus, the finished work, the grace of God and what it can do in my life, then it's based on something un it's, it's based on something that will not fail. Will not fail. A sure foundation. And so Jesus said this in verse 27. Notice this. Verse number 27. But Jesus looked at them. Now, the, that rich young ruler turned away sad when he said, there's one thing you lack. He just couldn't do it. And so all the disciples were saying, well, who then can be saved? You know, how are we going to get saved? Well, the better way. Verse 27, Jesus looked at them and said, with men, with men. See, that's old covenant. With men, it is impossible. Old covenant language. With men, it is impossible. But notice, but not with God. For with God, new covenant, all things are possible. With God. We're not without God. We're not without God anymore. We're not separated away from Him any longer. We're with Him. He's with us. He's for us. He's in us. And notice, with God, with God, new covenant, all things are possible. Amen. All right, then we go over into chapter 11. How about that? Anybody heard anything from Mark chapter 11 around here? All right, well, Jesus one day was walking along. They got hungry, and they didn't have McDonald's on the every corner and all these, you know, all these other places. But they had fig trees and those kind of things, so they would stop along the way and get something off a fig tree. So he saw a fig tree off at a distance with fig leaves on it, which meant, according to that particular fig tree in that area, that if you had leaves on the tree, you also had fruit on the tree. So Jesus went over there expecting to find something, found nothing on it. In other words, barren, fruitless. And so Jesus said this. He said, no one eat fruit from you ever again forever. No one eat fruit from you ever again. Just simple words. And he walked on his way. They went on to, uh, to clear out the temple, you know, and then on the next day, they came back, and they saw that fig tree dried up from the roots. Peter made a, a notice about it. He was looking. He said, behold, master, the fig tree that you dried up is withered away. Now, what's the significance of the fig tree? I've heard some people say, well, that, that has to do with Israel. Well, no, that's not true, because Jesus said, no one eat fruit from you ever again. And we know that Jesus... Uh, that the Lord has restored Israel even in our lifetime. So that couldn't be Israel, even though that's part of the fig tree thing. You have to go back to the, the law of first reference. When you go back to the law of first reference of a fig tree, you find it in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3, verse number 7. And what were they doing with the fig tree? Well, they took leaves off the fig tree and started sewing them together to try to cover up their own nakedness and shame. In other words, it was representative of man's efforts to overcome the sin issue, the sin problem, sin consciousness and condemnation. Now, how many of you know the thing about a, a fig tree leaf or any other leaf is temporary, okay? It's not going to last forever. These weren't polyester, you know, leaves or something like that. These were going to dry up and blow away. And then you still got the same problem. You did nothing about it. All you did was just cover it up. And see, that's man's solution is covering up. Dealing with superficial issues and not the root of the situation. And so when you, uh, you bring that back over here, right, into this context right here, Jesus wasn't just picking on a bad fig tree. He was actually addressing representative of self-righteousness and self-condemnation. 
Jesus' words, what Jesus did dealt with the root of the problem, not just the surface issues. Actually, what he was saying is, we're, we're closing out man's efforts to try to deal with sin. I'm fixing to go to the cross. I'm going to deal with the root of it. I'm going to pull it up in a way men can, cannot do it. Do you all see this? And so when they came by, you know, Peter said, all right, look, the fig tree that you, with, that you cursed is withered up from the roots, not from the outside in, but from the inside out. He dealt with the root of the issue. And Jesus took that and he said, have faith in God, new covenant. This is what this whole, whole thing opened up. Once you get rid of the condemnation, the sin consciousness, once you get rid of that sin uh, condition at the root, then what happens? All the fruit goes with it. All the fruit goes with it. You know, Jesus said, no one eat fruit from you ever again. Well, there's no fruit on that tree to begin with. So he obviously was talking about something else, right? And so Jesus said, have faith in God. Now other translation says, have the faith of God. Now notice he says, have. Not go get it, but have it. In other words, you've got it. It's, it's there for your disposal. In other words, if God intends for you to live by faith, he's going to give you his faith to live by. It's available for you. So he says, have faith in God. All right, verse 23. He said, for whosoever, for surely I say to you, whosoever, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things which he says shall come to pass, it shall be done. He'll have whatever he says. Now look at that phrase previously. Go back to the previous slide there. Notice it says, when he says to that mountain, this is the God kind of faith. This is what it does. This is kind of, it will produce the God kind of results when you use it the God kind of way. So he says, whoever says to this mountain, be removed to be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart. I want you to see that right there. Does not doubt in his heart. So what's the, what's the only thing that's going to keep this from happening? Doubt in the heart, not just the head, but doubt in the heart. Now, we really see a clear picture of this when we look at the Greek word for doubt. When you look at the Greek word for doubt right here, in the Greek, it's a compound word, diakrino. Dia means on account of or for this reason. And then krino means judgment or condemnation. So actually what it's translated here, doubt, this Greek word, means for the reason of self-condemnation. This is where doubt comes from. So if you are operating, still trying to deal with sin consciousness through your own efforts and not through the finished work of Jesus applied, then what's going to happen you're going to condemn yourself. And then when you go try to use the faith of God, the doubts are going to rise up, and they're going to say, uh-uh-uh, you can't expect that because you haven't done enough here or you've done too much of this over here. Where's the focus here? Here. You. If you want the God kind of faith, you're going to have to look unto Jesus. And not look to yourself. You know, I know that, you know, every week we come in here, we're dealing with this self-righteousness issue. But this is what's been perpetuated in the body of Christ. Because we've got that mixture of New and Old Testament. New covenant finished work and Old Covenant law. Well, guess what the enemy's going to use? He's going to use the old covenant law and your inability to keep that one thing that you lack and then you're going to end up condemning yourself and then the doubts are going to rise in your heart and nothing happens. The faith of God works. You just got to eliminate the doubts. See, if we can get rid of the sin consciousness and the self-condemnation, then we can get rid of the doubts 
that are keeping our faith from moving that mountain in your life. See, this is what the new covenant did that the old covenant could not do. Jesus eliminated and eradicated all reason for condemnation, guilt, and shame. And that sin consciousness in a way that no other thing could. See, the world's still trying to deal with that through man-made means and efforts. They try to medicate it, meditate it. They try to do all kinds of stuff. And it does no good without the application of the cross. Once you throw the cross, the tree, into the bitter waters, oh, they become nothing but sweet. When you throw the cross in, in your factor and you begin to believe according to the finished work of Jesus and Him alone, that uproots all that sin consciousness in your life. And guess what? There goes the doubts. There goes the unbelief. You know, there's only two incidences in Jesus' ministry where he actually complimented somebody for having great faith. And I got to looking at that one day, and I found out they were both outsiders. One of them was a Syrophoenician woman. Man, I tell you, she was not going to be denied. In fact, she just came and she was just almost nagging them to the point because she wasn't going to leave empty-handed. On the behalf of her daughter, who was demon-possessed. And the disciples came to Jesus and said, send her away. And Jesus said some things to her that would have offended most people. Thank God she wasn't a snowflake. She would have melted over in the corner somewhere in a fetal position. She didn't get her feelings hurt. You know what? She just, she just kept on. She was not going to relent at all. See, that's what the spirit of faith is all about. You're not going to be offended you're not going to be in the fetal position because the devil said something to you. You're going to be standing up and you're getting what you came for. Amen. Amen. And she got it. I mean, he, he finally said, great is your faith. Go your way as you believe. So, so be it. And it happened. Her daughter was delivered. But there's one other one. Let's go over to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew the 8th chapter. Because there's one other one. I want you to see this. And this is a story about the Roman centurion. The Roman centurion came to Jesus one day on behalf of his servant who was grievously tormented, even at the point of death. Verse 5, it says, Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said, I will come and heal him, just based on the man's simple faith. And then the centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go and he goes. To another, come and he comes. And to my servant, do this. And he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not in Israel. Now, Israel had the law, right? Don't you think they would have had faith? Well, that was the problem. Faith does not, our law does not produce faith. Law produces condemnation, and that produces doubts and unbelief and takes faith out, weakens faith. Now, listen, at any point in time, we've looked at this. It, just because Israel had the Mosaic law, that covenant, does not mean it overrode the Abrahamic covenant. They could have at any point in time taken the Abrahamic covenant, which was nothing but an unconditional promise of blessing, and stood on that and said, I believe God for this. And faith would have taken them over and above and around the law. It would have. It happened over and over again. But this man was not under the law. He came to Jesus knowing he was unworthy in and of himself. In other words, there was nothing in him that earned or merited this kind of response from Jesus. I want you to see this. It's great faith in operation. But notice he came to Jesus on the basis simply 
of Jesus' grace and mercy alone. That was it. See, that's what the law does. It does not produce faith. It leads you to faith. Faith in Jesus, which is all based on grace. Nothing else. Simple, pure grace. I know people want to take issue with the grace message, but what, what, are, what else are you going to do? You're never going to get to this point outside of the grace of God that God wants you to get. You cannot operate in faith outside of the grace of God. Faith means grace is involved. It's a response to the grace of God. We're not working for a paycheck. We're receiving an inheritance. And our inheritance is all by grace, and it has to be received by faith. That's why I emphasize these things over and over again. We had a big resurgence of faith back in the 80s, you know, during the Word of Faith movement. Well, where has that gone? Well, it got off into wrong believing again. got all mired up in the legalistic works of men. God's restoring it, but this time he's restoring it on the right basis, on the right foundation. And that is the pure grace of God in the new covenant. Glory to God. It's already, it's already started, folks. We're seeing miracles all over the place. We're going to have more miracles than you know what to do with around here. We're going to have demonstration. Listen, I've been preaching this for a long time. It's time to stand up and draw a line in the sand and say, this is it. I'm not moving. you got to be like the sour Phoenician woman. An outsider. Listen, she was an outsider. We're insiders. Yeah. This guy's an outsider. Yet Jesus complimented him for having great faith. Why? Because it was in the pure grace of God and not in his own works. He said, I've not found such great faith. Not in Israel. He looked all over the place. Didn't find this kind of faith. Sometimes faith is not found in the organized church. It's because people are so legalistically bound up. You get outside of this, you get over into the street somewhere, all they have to, to do is just fall on the grace and mercy of God, and God just does supernatural things for them. You say, well, what, what, what is this? God's doing something for them. I've been in this for decades. Yeah, but you've been in legalism for decades. You've been mired up in unbelief for decades. We just need to go back to the pure gospel of Jesus and get the results supernaturally that only faith in Him can bring. So notice what happened. Verse number 11. And it says, And I say to you, that men will come from the east and west, sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He didn't say Moses. It's Abrahamic covenant. In the kingdom of heaven. Notice verse 12. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out in outer darkness. They'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 13, notice this. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go your way. And as you have believed, so be it done for you. And his servant was healed from that very hour. You know what it tells us right there? He had great faith. In other words, great faith is not big faith. Great faith is just pure faith. It's just simple faith. Just simply in Jesus, the finished work. The more you get complicated in your faith, the more unbelief and doubt is going to arise. If you can just get back to the simplicity of looking to Jesus, His finished work and the grace of God. You know, because the enemy, he'll try to disqualify you to yourself, condemn you to yourself. Because he wants your qualification for receiving from God based on what you do and your performance. It's not based on your performance at all. I am bursting your bubble this morning. It is not based on your self-righteous performance at all. Zero. People won't get up and boast and say, well, it's my praying that did it. No, it wasn't. Your praying may have been involved, but your praying should have been a response to the finished work of Jesus and the grace of God. Otherwise, it's not going to do anything. You're not getting the first base. Amen. Notice he said, go your way and as you have believed, as you have believed, as you have believed. What are we believing today? Where's the focus of our faith? Is it on Jesus? 
Is it on kind of Jesus and kind of us somewhere in the, you know, in the mix in there too? Listen, if you're in the mix, you're going to have doubt and unbelief in your heart. You got to get rid of all that. You got to get it squarely on Jesus. Everybody stand up this morning. It's time to receive. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Lord. We believe and we receive. We take it. We take possession of it. Every one of you, draw that line in the sand. Listen, congregation, don't ask them how they feel. You get up and you respond correctly in faith and say, I believe according with you that you believe you receive according to that in that day. Thank you, Jesus. We're expecting that manifestation. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Based on the word of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise and thanksgiving, Lord. We magnify you. Thank you, Lord. We magnify you, Lord. We magnify you above these things. They're so small compared to you. They're so tiny compared to you. They're so insignificant compared to you and your power working on the inside of us right now. Thank you, Father. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord, that you've qualified us. To be partakers of the inheritance today. Thank you, Father. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. We give you glory, Jesus. We rejoice unto you, Jesus. We magnify and exalt the name of Jesus. Jesus' name, the name above every other name. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. We say right now that Jesus is Lord over sickness and disease. Jesus is Lord. Jesus, our champion, who won a victory for us. We receive your victory now in our bodies. We receive that now. We receive our healing. Lord, we take hold of it. Like a bulldog, man, we're not going to let it go. We possess it now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. It's over. This is the end of sickness and disease in your body. It's the beginning of life abundant. It's the beginning of of healing and wholeness. It's the beginning of divine health in your body. Thank you, Lord. It's a new day. It's a new day, and we rejoice in you. We rejoice in you and give you glory. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for what you've done in this place this morning. Thank you for what you've done in our midst. Father, we return to give you praise and thanksgiving. Come on, church, just for a couple more moments. Can we just give God a praise? Can we worship him together? Thank him for what he's done. Lord, with grateful hearts, abounding in thanksgiving, we give you glory. We give you honor. We worship you this morning, Jesus. We honor you this morning, Jesus. We say Jesus is our healer, and we worship you. We magnify you, Jesus. You are greater. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. We give you praise, Jesus, for all the wonderful things, all the good things that you've done for us. Every good, every perfect gift, it comes down from you, Jesus. We offer thanksgiving, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, everybody can be seated. Praise God. Praise God. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Our God is a good God. Our God is good and He only does good. He's not out to hurt us, cause us pain, inflict us. That's not our God. Our God redeemed us from that. Galatians 3.13 says that Christ has redeemed us from the curse. From the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. Then verse 14, it says, So that the blessing of Abraham might come upon us through faith. Amen. The curse is over in your life. Amen. The the day of the curse reigning in your body is over. The curse is over. Jesus has set us free from that. Jesus set us apart. We've been set apart, apart from the curse, apart from the enemy, apart from anything that he has, apart from the darkness, the kingdom of darkness, set apart into a different kingdom, into a different place. We've been brought into the blessing. Amen. 
Praise God. Well, while you guys are getting your offerings envelope, offerings envelope, offering envelopes ready right in front of you if you need one. If you're watching this by recording, there's a couple ways that you can give. You can go onto our website, church316.org. Select the give option. Just follow the prompts on the screen. There's a safe and secure way for you to be able to give. And so your gift here at Church 316, or if you like to send a check, you can send it to P.O. Box 1316. Watkinsville, Georgia, 30677. Our offering scripture this morning is found in the book of Isaiah 58, verse 11. I love this verse. It says, The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul even in drought and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Even in the midst of drought, even in the midst of what we're experiencing is different than what we're expecting, our souls can still be like a well-watered garden. Not dry, not empty, not void, not bearing fruit, but it can be flourishing. Even in times of when people around you are in chaos, are in drought, because of what Jesus has done for us and because of his spirit on the inside of us, we can be like a well-watered garden, producing flourishing. Amen. So right where you're seated, this is a moment of worship between you and your heavenly father. So hold up your offerings before the Lord. Father, we give this morning with cheerful, faith-filled, expectant hearts. Father, we honor you this morning with our tithes and offerings. Lord, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to sow and give into the kingdom of God. Lord, you've been so good to us. You've been so faithful to us. And Father, we love to give. You have been so generous and gracious towards us. And Father, we love to give back into the kingdom of God, to see it advance, to see the gospel go out so that the message of Jesus, the message of God's grace can get out to other people. And Father, right now we give. And I command this, this seed to be blessed in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for a mighty harvest off of this seed in Jesus' mighty name. Good measure. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. God, you give seed to the sower, bread for the eating, and you multiply our seed sown. You cause every grace, every favor, and earthly blessing to come to us in abundance so that we, having all sufficiency in all things, we have enough to give to every good work. In Jesus' mighty name, and everybody said amen. Amen. The buckets are on the way this morning. We love y'all so much. We'll see y'all Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. Y'all go and have a blessed afternoon. Amen and amen.